Proverbs 24, verses 8 through 9. The one who plans to do evil, men will call a schemer. The devising of folly is sin, and the scoffer is an abomination to men. It's kind of, these, some of these proverbs are written kind of unusually in English, and you almost have to go back and retranslate them a little bit to try to figure out exactly the contents. Um, one thing I, that, brought, that was brought to my attention um, and I thought was accurate is that which is devised in the heart is that which reveals this true nature. So in dealing with the overall scheme of scripture, dealing with a person's true nature, it's always about what he plans to do. It's their, uh, their, their, their overall purpose, what they want in life. The one who plans evil, if that's truly what you're planning, is hated even amongst unbelievers. You see that happen. I mean, there are people that are that have their own ilk and and they all kind of devise together. But typically, if a person is devising evil, that the world itself actually hates those individuals. And it's still true to this day, even though it seems to be less and less actual. The fool is the one who does not check his thoughts with the thoughts of God. And so in, in these situations, we often look at the, um, the action um, and try to find out who's the fool. But if you're going to self-evaluate, one of the things you have to self-evaluate, am I actually putting my thoughts up against the thoughts of God? If not, then basically if God tells you you're not, you're not thinking correctly because left to our own devices, left to our own thoughts, we're just a cesspool of evil. We have to realize that even as believers, our thoughts don't become pure. We still have to check them with the thoughts of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the God of creation, the God who has planned out uh, your redemption for not only us, but for the whole world. We thank you that even from the fall of man, even from the first creation, before he fell, you knew what you would do. We have a great God, an awesome God who, who knows us better than we know ourselves. God, grant us the wisdom to be able to hear the, your word, to not dismiss it or to not treat it lightly, but to, to study it with earnest expectation that we will understand your revelation. Help us to grasp these things. Help us to encourage one another, to love one another in grace, in mercy, in truth, so that when we are discouraged, we will find encouragement. When things seem out of control, we know who's in control. And when this world comes crashing down, we have something to look forward to, and that is, who you are in the scope of eternity, and who we are in you in eternity as well. We thank you for those promises. Allow us to rely upon them and take comfort. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Book of Philippians, continuing our study. Um, what are we on? Part four of uh, four through nine? Been here for a while. Uh, I have enough notes to get through verse eight today, so there will be a part six so that you know, so I, I, I honestly, when, when, when dealing with the text itself, you know, in four, four through nine, I could have just said, oh, verse four, verse five, verse six, verse seven. But the one reason why I kind of keep it in this motif of, of Philippians four, four through nine, part such and such is because I don't want to lose continuity while really digging deep into the text. I do have, um, for my second hour, I do have four pages of notes, which is a. Uh, optimistic of me. So we'll see what happens. All right. We'll go ahead and read the text that we're, we're studying. It's Philippians 4, 4 through 9. I, yeah, I reverted. Thought I fixed this last week. Oh, well. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. 
Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. So what we've been talking about over the last couple of weeks is, is a beautiful passage that is loved by everybody, right? But we need to renew our understanding. We can't just flippantly recite this passage, even if we haven't memorized, even if we studied it before. We have to renew our understanding so that we will allow the text to actually speak for itself and allow what Paul intended to convey through the Holy Spirit to the Philippian church to be properly represented. If one is not thinking the same thing in the Lord, it will yield disharmony, anxiety, strife, quarrel, sin, which is actually represented in chapter 4, verses 2 through 3, and probably all the way back to 3, 2. The question is, how can you have peace? And there's certain aspects of peace in which we are all kind of concerned about, right? Uh, you know, it's kind of strange. 10 o'clock, it got a little left heavy, so, you know. We were talking about that, you know, for 9 o'clock hour. The question is, how can you have peace? What kind of peace? Are we fighting? Well, not necessarily. We talked today, I think a lot of it is there's there's a certain level of, of anxiety, I'll use the word, uh, and the fact that the, the world is crazy, right? And I was talking with Sarah, I says, you know, if you turn off the news and you just drive around Liberty or Independence and go to the store, or go out to eat, do you see the, the craziness? Turn off the news, please. <laughs> I'm like, honestly, I haven't I, I haven't listened to talk radio. I haven't watched the news. Occasionally, I'll catch a glimpse of a headline. But honestly, I don't even read it anymore. Why? Because I'm not witnessing it. And everyone is going over crazy over situations that we have no contact over. Now, it doesn't mean that we want to be oblivious. At the same time, if we're finding ourselves not at peace, then we need to d get rid of the distraction and focus on the truth. Okay? That's the general concept. Philippians 4, 4 through 9 is telling you how to have peace. How do I know that? Well, it says that the peace of God, which surpasses all in a, a comprehension. I mean, think about it. In times of turmoil, either within your personal life or within world chaos, Paul is in prison in Rome. And persecution of Christianity, of, of believers, is ramping up crazy. And he goes, you can have peace. I don't think we understand that kind of stress. But he can have peace. And we're going to talk more and more about that as it goes through. Because even in verse 413, you know, I can do all things who, through him who strengthens me. What's it about? It's about being at peace. Being content with where you are and what you have. And, and also, verse 9, and the God of peace will be with you. Peace is the, formal, is the foremost concept. And peace is more than just being without strife. It's also about internal. Not having this type of overly or unruly or undual, sorry, unduly concern about your life and the things you can't control. This passage in Philippians um, has seven, seven imperatives. We've gone through five. All right. The first five, re rejoice and rejoice. I, do men, I, I don't put them as one, I put them as two because I think it's important. If the Bible repeats it, I want to repeat it as well. Uh, let your gentleness or actually your reasonableness be known. Uh, be anxious about nothing. Have nothing that is unduly or concerned. And remember, we talked about concern last week in which there is a proper concern. There is something that we should be worried about. But it shouldn't be about things that are outside of our control. And if, and if ever we are, we should never be paralyzed by that concern either. And so therefore, what do we do? Let your request be made known before God with prayer, with supplications, with thanksgiving, understanding who it is that we are dealing with. We are supposed to let God worry about it. Next, we're going to be going on to think these things. And, of course, there is a long, long list of things we're supposed to think. 
Uh, we're going to talk about that word specifically, think, because it is, uh, it's not unique in Philippians. We've, we dealt with it one time before, but I really didn't, uh, I purposely kind of skipped the concept or, or a word study on it because I wanted to deal with it here and not back at in chapter three. And finally, do these things, which we'll get to hopefully next week. So we're going to think certain things, and next week we're going to do certain things. It's going to lay out very nicely for us in preparation. These five imperatives and these two imperatives, I, I think, are, are really an important concept to grasp in dealing with the problem in the Philippian church. Now, we talked about it before. Philippians have had a huge problem. It's not like the Corinthian church. It's not even like the Galatian church or the, or the group of believers that James is referring to. This is a good church. This is a church that has a lot going for it, and he, he, he encourages them to continue in these things, continue in these things, be better, continue, because it could always get better. Uh, but there always seems to be an issue. It's kind of like golf. Anybody here play golf or watch golf or know somebody who does watch golf or have an idea what golf is? <laughs> All I always uh, remember golf being described as um, hitting a little white ball and chasing it. Why, why hit it to begin with? It's right there. So in dealing with golf, it's kind of a, a known idea that whenever you play, you're always working on something. My drives are horrible. You get your drives fixed, my short game goes. Oh, this is horrible. And so you're always working on an aspect of your game. It's never honed in. If it was, you'd be Tiger Woods in the 90s. So you'd be. See, everything seemed to click all at the same time. So, the, so a lot of times churches are like that. Now, I don't like to relate that to an individual because I think Paul got it, right? Individuals can get it. But usually within a church dynamic, there's always something that needs to be worked on. And, and so Philippians is no different. There's something that has to be fixed. And I do believe this is a lack of unity that, that is presented within the church. And because of that, when there's lack of unity, there's strife. There's some type of disagreement. There's issues. There's a lack of peace. And so this deals with their issue particularly. But... We can obviously use that, the principles behind this, to deal with any problem we may have. You have a problem with your kids. This is perfect. Unification in mind, talking to them and getting their, their thoughts out there and making sure we're thinking the same thing. Uh, other family dynamics, friend dynamics, church leadership, whatever it may be, Philippians, Philippians 4, 4 through 9, is the principles behind the solution. Let's deal with some of the language here. I do want to actually take a very close look at this and actually even deal with the word finally. Now, if you notice in chapter 3, verse 1, there's the word finally. And it's hilarious to actually read this in some current certain um, commentaries. He goes, Paul just doesn't know how to end a book. They actually said that. Paul keeps on trying to finish, but he keeps on coming up with something else. No. Finally is the word ha loipas. Uh, it's the and to the end or the remaining things. Loipas is a word for that which remains. And in context, um, I think that at times people have used this in the Greek language and other letters to, do, to basically say, I'm, going, I'm concluding my letter now. The rest of the things are this, and they kind of just finish up. You can tell they're ending. However, because Paul uses this regularly through various different letters in the middle of letters, we have to take more of a contextual look at this word. Um, the question that you have to ask when you run into this particular phrase is, what remaining what? what? What are you talking about, Paul? Are you finishing up your letter, or are you talking about that which remains in context? And so in chapter four, uh, chapter four, verses four through seven, he gives some very specific things to do, things to think, okay, in response to the issues. But it's not the complete story. That's specific, and he's going to move toward general concepts. Paul is about to speak on the remaining thoughts about how to have peace. We, we obviously saw that because... Right before verse 8, right before the finally, you have the peace of God, which shall guard your hearts and mind. And we also see in verse 9, and the God of peace will be with you. They're connected. 
He's not beginning a new thought. Paul is not introducing a new theme. He's concluding the previous one. He's not trying to finish his book. He's finishing his thought. And he's going to give some very generalistic concepts. I believe that if Paul felt that he could write a letter that was lengthy, I think he would probably elaborate a lot on verse 8. But he's taking for granted the fact that this is a mature group of believers that would be able to understand these words in the concept and be able to talk amongst themselves through the issues. I think we can do the same thing. Um, why? Because we have other letters, because we have other texts and scriptures that will be able to help us understand this particular um, list with clarity without having to use our own imaginations. Now, has anybody written, uh, um, has anybody looked at or listened to anything on Philippians 4, 8 recently? There's very few. I, I'm not going to say there's none. Very few, if any, commentators or theologians that don't use their own imagination when dealing with the list in verse 8. We can't do that. They'll actually, I heard one guy say, um, what is lovely? And he actually went off and says, isn't a sunset lovely? Isn't a tree lovely? Isn't your wife lovely? Think on these things. To which I have to say, <laughs> seriously. Now, those things are true. But is that what Paul is trying to convey? That's the question we have to ask. Um, moving in before we actually get to the list, whatever, if any. Now, again, when things are repeated, we should pay attention, right? Now, sometimes things are just language. Sometimes it's just, you know, if you see a lot of thes, does it mean you have to take a look at the thes? Sometimes. But I do want to make sure we understand the whatever, and then it changes over to if any, if there is any. If anything, um, whatever is not whatever, you know, whatever is actually hasis. Um, hasis is a word that compares things or ideas that are similar. It's a pronoun, but it's a comparative pronoun. Uh, it's interesting that they translate this whatever. Typically, even in the New Testament, this is not translated whatever. Um, it can compare quality. As great as, as long as, if it's talking about something that is, you know, great in length, for example. Uh, so quality, as great as. It can compare quantity, as many as, or as much as. And it can compare extent to the same degree. Okay, so we have a kind of like an idea here, this word uh, hasis. Uh, that really allows us to be able to look at the at the text and try to understand exactly what it is that Paul is trying to convey by looking at this particular pronoun. But we have more than that. We also have if any, etis. Etis, and, and it's translated if any. So we got the etis, if any, and that's very literal, which is not bad. I like it literal and let us figure it out, right? speaks to a fulfilled condition and speaks to reality, not a conceptual or theoretical concept. Uh, throughout scripture, etis is used and it's always speaking in terms of things that are real. It's not a question, it's used for identification. So here we have both Hostus and etis used in regards to words that we recognize, or maybe words that we don't necessarily recognize, but we recognize at least a few of these, right? True, honorable, right? Um, even words that are we don't know necessarily what it means. What does it mean that whatever is lovely? Uh, good repute. We'll take a look at these words in its list next hour. Um, in regard to the this list... There's nothing to compare it. He's not comparing true with honorable. That's not what it's saying. He's saying this hostess 
is is comparable to something that is true and it's and it's within that those terminologies of etis it's reality more than that all right speaks to reality and i conceptual theoretical concept more than that we have this sentence it's a compound sentence there's two verbs as many things that's the word hoss says are there's a verb there dot 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 think these things so the adjectives that are going to be used here are going to fill the blank okay we're going to fill in the blank with true we're going to fill the blank with right and the verb is borrowed in english we have the word is when you go through the greek text there's only one is and it's at the first whatever is true whatever honorable so the, the verb is carried over and used into and kind of placed in there and we put it in there because otherwise you know people think that the bible was written in some type of foreign language <laughs> took you a while you know there's people out there that do believe that the bible was written in english there are even sarah had a, had a friend right yeah recently wait the bible wasn't written in english and that's where the old joke comes in. You know, if the King James Version is good enough for Paul, it's good enough for me. <laughs> it is an old, uh, old translation, but <laughs> there we go. Um, so it's a compound sentence with a lot of direct objects. And those direct objects are adjectives. Now, there's two at the bottom, excellence and praise. Those are nouns. Okay, so, but the adjectives are using substantively. So we're, we're looking at those adjectives as something that is uh, uh, descriptive, but at the same time, it's, it's used as a noun. The verb itself here, as many things are, is the, word, is the verb I me, but it's translated in the present active indicative. In the actual Greek text, it's estin. Whenever you're going through a Greek text and you run into the verb estin, um, that's very important a present active indicative of the verb i me points to absolutely reality it's not just a linking verb so you have estin it is what things are it's reality paul is expecting the believers through the uh, pronoun hosses through the uh, grammatical pattern of etis with the verb estin to be transferred over to the rest of the passage Paul is expecting the believers to be objective in their evaluation, to find the things that are, not the things that might be, not the things that are conceptual. So when we're looking at this list and you go, well, I know it's true. I was born in Salt Lake City, Utah. Let me ponder that. No, there's something greater than that. Now, is that true? But that's more of a that's more of a of a of an idea within my own concept. It's my thoughts. Uh, there's a there's a, a popular uh, shirt phrase going around: "Speak your truth," which is an oxymoron, right? Because uh, what's well, true for you is not true for me. Well, that's relativism, and it makes absolutely no sense. That the I've actually had an argument, well, a lively discussion. Back in the, when I used to work at Don Shula's with, a, with one of my bus boys about absolute truth. And of course, you know the joke, right? And I actually use this on him. He goes, there is no absolute truth. Are you absolutely sure about that? And he didn't catch it. He's like, yes. Okay. One of my friends laughed. He's like, what are you laughing at? He goes, You're, you just made an absolute statement. If there's no absolute truth, you can't say that. So it's, it's kind of a, it's a fun way to talk with people. It rules well. So we're, we got to look at this at this phrase and this entire list very literally, very uh, stringently. That whatever we're talking about is not within ourselves. It's not within our own thoughts. It's not conceptual or theoretical, but we're actually looking for things which have been already revealed to us by the truth. God, Jesus Christ. 
this is not a subjective evaluation. It's not based upon the mind of man. We just talked about that. If left to our own devices without having our thoughts checked by God, it ends in just a big mess. The list deals with reality and believers are supposed to be able to identify them. And we're all supposed to agree with the identification and dwell upon them. The adjectives and nouns or the yeah, adjectives and nouns in this list. The imperative, the things, think these things, the word think here is the verb logizomai. I've dealt with the verb logizomai in Romans. I dealt with it a lot. Okay, I skipped it in Philippians, um, which is used in 3.13, which says, Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. Regard. Okay? Because I wanted to deal with it thoughtfully here. Now, remember back in the day, back in the introduction to Philippians, from some, what, 65 lessons ago? You all remember that, right, clearly? Uh, and I've got, I've gone through this a couple different times through the book, is that we have thought words. And it, it's appropriate now to reintroduce ourselves to thought. Um, the first thought word we actually have in the book of Philippians is the word mene. It's forced thinking about a subject translated into remembrance. It's in verse chapter 1, verse 3. In every remembrance of you. In other words, Paul doesn't just walk around, you know, he's in Corinth or he's over in Rome in prison, goes, oh, the Philippians, oh, that's right, I just remember them. No, he forces the thought. We kind of use the word remember as kind of a passive concept, but remember, mene is actually an active concept, that we're actually forcing the thought, and we remember then we have the word patho, um, which, you know, a lot of people like this to be persuaded or uh, to to persuade about a truth or proposition. Use six times. One six says, for I'm confident. That's the word patho right there. I'm confident. I'm persuaded. Um, and it's active, actually. It says I am actually persuading about this truth. I, I, I think that's uh, lost in translation there. In chapter three, verses three through four, it says, for we are the true circumcision who worship the Spirit of God and, and glory and glory in, in Christ Jesus, and but no confidence. I'm not persuaded by the by the of the truth or proposition of the flesh. The flesh tries to persuade me, does it not? We all know this, and we are ones who are not to be persuaded by the flesh. And Paul says, if anybody does have that opportunity to be persuaded by the flesh. It'd be me, but I don't. You had the word phroneo. This is the, the, the most used word. Okay, we've gone over this word several times. I'm not going to have you look at any of these fat verses. But that means to think, to set one's mind on, to develop an attitude. Think, um, and it, the in, in chapter 2 where it says, have this attitude, it's the word phroneo. In chapter 4, verse 2, to live in harmony is actually the word phroneo. And so it's... It's used all over the place. It's actually also used in verse 10. The word concern is for now oh, to think about me to, uh, intently sometimes to develop an attitude or to set my mind, set their mind on them. You have the word dokeo, seems, used once in chapter 3, verse 4. Um, although I have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Everybody has a, a thought. And the word actually has an, as, a, as a negative connotation to it. In other words, don't don't presume. Hegemai, to consider, count, determine the cost, and then decide. Use six times. One of my favorite verses in Scripture is two six, who although he existed in the form of God, that is Jesus Christ, did not regard hegemai equality with God a thing to be grasped. So this equal this this regard, when we talked about this Christ according to the text and according to what we know about God, made a decision after determining the entire cost of it. He didn't, he didn't decide to come down as a man going, I wonder how this is going to turn out. He knew exactly what he was doing. And he decided to do it anyway, which is, uh, whew, I don't know if I could do that, which is why I'm not God. 
in verse 7 of chapter 3, whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted. I looked at it. I determined it. I looked at all the costs. I looked at the lost cost evaluation. And I looked at the things that are determined to be normally positive in my life, the, the list of his accolades here, and said, you know what? I'm actually considering them to be loss. Hmm. Imagine having, I, I want to have that mindset. Paul's example of looking at my life and things that would normally be considered to be gain, I actually look at it and go, as compared to knowing Christ, if that's all I had, would that be enough? Oyamai, suppose or presumption, used only once in, in, in Philippians 1.16. And this is where the, uh, the uh, Christians, believers, were giving out the gospel, supposing, that's another presumption word, presuming that they were doing harm to Paul. He goes, okay, go ahead. I don't care. Enjoy yourselves. If you think you're doing harm by giving out the gospel, do me harm. <laughs> Cardia. We know this word well. Deep inner recesses of the mind, used twice, 1747. Um, I think we know that one pretty well. It's not the thumper. It's the, it is a mind word. It is a thought word. Epinosis, knowledge that is more clear, better understood. Um, I, I, I've... There's a lot of people that have a thought on epinosis. This is my conclusion, looking at the word in full context and full use of the word. It's a better understanding, not a deeper, but better, more clear. Use once in one nine. And this, I pray that your love may abound still more and more in. And I and oh, take your pen. If, they, if you have a, a reel in front of knowledge, no, better knowledge or clearer knowledge is, is, is a... Um, a better English rendering there. Not a real knowledge. A stasis, mental faculty, ability to see or understand. Use only once in one nine, and that is in real knowledge and discernment. The mental faculty with the ability to see truly or understand what is really, really happening. And that's why the translators deal with the discernment. That I can actually see, I can discern the truth. Um, this word is also used in the Gospels where Jesus Christ tells the people, hey, you can look up at the sky and say, hey, it's a red morning, probably rain. You're discerning that. But you can't discern the fact that I'm standing right here in front of you. <laughs> kind of strange. Now we come to Legizomai. What word do we get from that? And in various different forms, logic. There is a way of thinking that is proper. Uh, people argue over what is logical, do they not? You know, they, they deal with a lot with uh, with human logic, and one of the reasons why I know that we can't rely upon human logic is because people can make a great argument and, and both be very persuasive and saying exactly opposite things. I was telling a story um, recently about uh, a friend of mine. We worked together. We were close friends. We worked in TSA, and before we started re really writing the standard operating procedures for Miami International Airport, and we were discussing the proper way to do something. Uh, I, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, I can't even remember what it was. But, but I had a manager, and she had to make the decision which way to go. They were both opposite. It's either you're doing it downstairs or upstairs or upstairs or downstairs. You can't have both. And we both had our arguments for why both locations were better. I'm using that as, a, as an example. And she sat there literally, and I gave my presentation. She goes, yeah, I think that's right. And then she looked at my friend, and he gave his presentation. He goes, yeah, I think that's right. And she just looked at us stone-faced. What? I'm like, you can't have both. you got to choose one. She goes, well, uh, I go, see, that's what it means to be in charge. You don't have to make a decision. But that's actually what happens. Human logic does not seem to fall upon people a whole lot. And you can make arguments and both sound persuasive. And it depends upon who finished last. That's why closing arguments, right? Sometimes it's, it's not who, fin who made the better argument. It's who made the last argument. So legitimize is that idea to calculate, to evaluate, to conclude by reasoning. And it's used here in 313, which we've already read in 4.8. 
Now, logizomai was originally a commercial term. It's used to as someone who evaluates goods and counts them as currency, like a barter system. Um, my favorite uh, example is it's, it's, it's a movie, I know, and where somebody owed money and he was paid in fluke. Because I don't know what fluke is. It's a fish. Because how, how do we, what are we supposed to do with this? You know, and so they have an evaluation. You owe money, you owe a certain debt, and you are able to come and say, listen, I don't have the money, but I have two goats. And they go, okay, I'll take your two goats and we'll call your debt even. That's the word legizomai. And so that's that barter system that you're able to do. I tried that at the store once. I said, I'll give you my Apple Watch for the $300 in groceries. They didn't want to take it. Um, it was a series one. <laughs> I actually asked that one time, and a woman had no idea what I was talking about. I said, can I barter this? And she's like, what? Barter? She's like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'll go, okay, never mind. Joke's lost then. The word is oftentimes understood as imputation, which is why, if you can think about it, if you know Romans at all, why imputation is such a key term within the book of Romans. In fact, let's go there. Romans 4. Well, I want to know what was true. Why are you doing this to me? Because what are we supposed to do with this list? Legizomai. If we don't understand what legizomai mean, um, then the list is lost anyway. The best example of legizomai is obviously found within how God does it. Chapter 4, verse 1, what then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, is found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was legitimai to him as righteousness. It was credited. It was imputed. This is where we get the idea that we're, we don't become righteous. That would be stated clearly in the text. We are considered righteous. We have a debt, a sin debt, and I, and I think this is overplayed a lot of times, but I think it still works. We have a sin debt, and God says, what are you going to do to pay for your sin? And we go, nothing. He goes, good enough for me. No, of course, we had to believe in Jesus Christ, and faith believed God, and that, which is nothing, is credited to him as righteousness. To the unbeliever, you still have that debt, so to speak. It's Don't look at this as literal transaction. It's how God considers it. It's how God logically moves through it. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not credited, same word, as a favor, but what is due? See, that's a beautiful concept, is it not? Because typically, when we want to evaluate what we think is actually worth anything, we have to work for it. Nothing's free. We are taxed for the air we breathe. Nothing's free. But God says to him who does not work, but believes, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David in verse 6 also speaks of the blessings on the man who God credits righteousness apart from works. Look at verse 8. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. He does not take my sin and put it to my account. Why? Because Jesus Christ has already paid for it. And David even talks about that. Abraham talks about this. It's one of the amazing things about the truth about the veracity or the effectiveness of the cross work of Christ is it covers past, present, future, and they knew about what would happen, and they actually talked about it as if it was still applied, which is true, because Christ was crucified before the foundation of the earth. Paul then uses this word, not in the way that God credits, not the way that God logically uh, deduces something, but how he deals with it. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. For I consider 
that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that is to be revealed to us. Paul deals with it. He weighs it out. He compares and contrasts. He looks at the actual cost of something, and he makes a determination. The things I'm looking forward to cannot compare to the things that I'm experiencing now, good or bad. People look at it and go, oh, it's the bad things he's talking about, good or bad. Remember, Paul had a, had a lot of success spiritually, physically in this life. And he goes, good or bad, it cannot compare to what we're going to get. So that logical-based system that Paul is implore, using here, um, founded in Christ's thoughts, founded in the mind of Christ and how he logically progresses through, through information, Paul borrows that to make a determination about the value of what's coming versus what's here. And now, in Philippians, we'll close on this, Paul, through the Holy Spirit, is instructing these believers to think, to take account to consider the reality. Remember, we still have to deal with the fact that we have an R and Estin, and we have a pronoun and a, and a formation etis that all point to the reality of the thing. To consider the reality in contrast to human logic and use the logic of Jesus Christ, have the mind of Christ, and evaluate what is real from the perspective of God, and we're going to use the scripture to do it. We can't sit there and say, think on things that are true and have the truth be something of our own imagination or experience. It has to be evaluated by how God evaluates, how God logically progresses through the word truth. I hope that makes sense. I hope you're ready for next hour. We have a lot to do. Well, next hour, next Sunday, and hopefully not the Sunday after that, but we'll see. But I, I, I get goosebumps over this stuff because I want to know the mind of Christ. And this, I think, will probably cinch it up for us. From all what we've done all the way back in chapter 2, chapter 1, and dealt with the 10, 11 things that we kind of looked at as the mind of Christ, this right here is a an, an, an immersion into the mind of Christ. Let's pray. God in heaven, thank you that we have this opportunity to think, to logically progress through your word, to understand what you say is true, honorable, lovely, so that we will be able to not guess or not use our own experience to determine these things, but we actually think on, on who you are and what you have done for us. Help us to consider your character, your actions, your revelation as we progress through this text. We thank you for everyone who's here. For those who are not, we pray for them, that they are well. That if they can't be here, we pray that they, they, they take proper measures for their own health and safety and help us to show grace and mercy to everyone as an example of who you are for us so that we will be able to share that example with the, with the rest of the world in truth. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For those online, we will pick it up. Uh, we'll reset the, the, the stream.